It is Tuesday the 10th of September. I'm at New York University and I'm privileged to be talking with Professor Sam Zakharov, who is a professor of constitutional law here. Sam, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. So we're going to have a general conversation about uh, President Trump and the, his relationship with the uh, federal judiciary. Um, but let's start by just talking about the structure of the federal judiciary itself. From our distance, we're, we're familiar with the, uh, the nine members of the US Supreme Court, but there's a whole uh, structure that lies beneath the US Supreme Court level. Can you tell us uh, what that is in very broad terms? Well, in broad terms, these are all uh, creations of Congress, which has the authority to create lower federal courts. And we have uh, courts that are a district court level, which try in the federal system, which tries cases, and courts of appeals. And as a formal matter, they all go through the same process of appointment and confirmation uh, by the Senate that the Supreme Court does as a practical matter. Historically, the, uh, the political forces have not been as active at those levels, and generally the senators from any particular state would have the power to appoint most of these people, and the president would go along with them. Um, that has changed in recent times, and now you have a great many judicial appointments to the federal bench who are appointed in complete disregard of the state political structure. And so we've had more politicization, more hearings, more contentious hearings uh, of the lower federal courts as well. Okay. So you say this has changed in recent times. When, when do you date it from and what were the drivers to, towards that change? I think that uh, beginning with the Robert Bork nomination to the Supreme Court in uh, 1986 and then uh, the reaction to uh, the presidential election in 2000 to the Bush v. Gore decision that there was more attention paid than at any time since the civil rights era to who are the federal judges and this began to play down much further into the um, popular consciousness. That's one element. The other element is that both parties have used access to the courts as a way to try to frustrate executive uh, decision making. And so we have a lot of debates about nationwide injunctions and the ability of one federal district court to strike down as unconstitutional and enjoin uh, federal conduct, which we saw with Obamacare on the one hand, and we've seen, we see it now with uh, some of the Trump uh, immigration policies and so forth. Yeah. So we'll come to that conflict between uh, the judiciary and the executive in a moment, but just staying uh, with the process of appointment, um, there is, from an Australian perspective, um, a rather extreme polarization within your federal judiciary. You have judges who are seen to be Republican judges and judges who are seen to be Democrat judges. Uh, mercifully, we've been spared that sort of polarization in Australia. But when does that date from? Is that the same, over the same time frame that we've been uh, speaking about or is, it, or is it deeper and is it longer than that? I think it's longer. I think that the judges are supposed to be political in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. I, I tell my students that when the Supreme Court decides a case 5-4, that's usually a good thing, not a bad thing. And it's a good thing because by the time something gets to the Supreme Court and divides the court 5-4, it's probably you're at a point where law is starting to run out. And so you, what the judiciary represents in our system is the politics of years past weighing on the present. It's a break, it's a check, it's supposed to slow down the process of the political uh, leaders getting too far ahead of what the society or the Constitution can tolerate. Um, now this was hidden in the United States because the Republican and Democratic parties were not ideologically coherent for most of our history. It was only after the Democrats of the South became Republicans and the Republicans of the North became Democrats, that you started to have a real sense of ideological divide uh, between the parties. And that has uh, 
had all sorts of effects upon our politics, but it's also had an effect upon judicial appointments. They are more contentious than they have been in the past. Now, in the final days of the uh, Obama administration, we watched on television the difficulties with the nomination of Merrick Garland to replace Antonin Scalia um, in the Supreme Court. Uh, and so the Supreme Court was, I forget for how long, but some months uh, with only eight members out of the nine and still managed to function. But uh, similar difficulties were being encountered at other levels in the judiciary, weren't they, at that time? Yes, I actually, during that period, uh, started to believe that even-numbered uh, apex courts might actually be a good thing. One of the things that the paradox is my colleague Jeremy Waldron uh, raises this is it's all well and good to have judicial review. It's not clear why a simple majority has to be the default rule. And that puts too much pressure on any single appointment. It might be possible, for example, to have, and we have uh, in American history, had Supreme Courts of different sizes. So mm -hmm. nine is not constitutionally enshrined. It might be better to have eight or 10 or 12, some number, so that to strike down what Congress and the President want would require effectively 60 percent or so. It would require more than just the one vote that tips it a Justice O'Connor or Justice Kennedy who pr managed to spend much of his or her career as the fifth vote in every single case. So can you test that uh, hypothesis against the actual outcomes during that period? Well, it would have made it much more difficult to have uh, the kind of uh, judicial response that we've had in many of these cases. It would have privileged the political process. Yeah. Now, that's generally a good thing. The problem we have, which is really the problem of, of the judiciary today, is that there's a great deal of dysfunction in our political process. So we have a breakdown in the congressional ability to act, and we have the delegation increasingly not to the political branches, but to the administrative agencies, which means that the judiciary becomes basically the only check upon increasing executive power. So my, my love for the idea that more should be left to the political arena depends heavily on the political arena working, and that's not a given right now. The uh, Trump appointments to the federal judiciary, how are they going? Well, mixed. Um, I think that at the first instance courts, the district courts, there's a lot of people being appointed who are not prepared yet. They're very, very young. They're in their late 30s, something of that sort. They have very little experience that would lead them to be uh, thought of as judges, and they're basically mining political connections to get there. That's not a great system. At the higher levels, at the Court of Appeals and then at the Supreme Court, President Trump, I think it's fair to say, is not attentive to details. And he has largely delegated this process to others, most notably to the people from the Federalist Society who have been grooming judges for some time. And the truth is that there are a few appointments that seem to be hard ideologues. Uh, but for the most part, these are highly capable people. And I've had a number, I, I serve as an advocate at times, I've had a number of arguments in front of uh, judges appointed by, uh, by the Trump administration who've been excellent judges, who are people who come up from the state solicitor general's office or from the academy or are distinguished people. And they are more conservative, obviously, if you uh, move to the hot button issues, abortion, guns, probably predictable how they'll come up. But you get most of what the judiciary does, and I'm sorry, uh, Stephen, if this- Most of, is hum, most of it is humdrum, we will uh, that. Yes, okay, yeah. that's exactly, yeah. I was gonna yeah. say something more flattering, yeah. intellectually challenging in a special way, but yeah. yes, humdrum captures it. Um, and they are good judges. They handle these things very well. And that's true at the Supreme Court level also. Um, certainly the appointments of, of Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh had their moments of high drama, cert, 
uh, of course, mm. and unfortunately. But these were judges who would have been appointed by any Republican president. They were at the top of the list of the most capable judges uh, on the courts of appeals, and there was nothing shocking about the selection of either one of them. Okay. Now, you mentioned earlier um, the conflict that is occurring between the executive and the uh, judiciary, and you attribute that uh, to some degree to the absence of other political checks within the system. Can you just talk about that for a moment, the, the breakdown of the congressional uh, check on presidential power? We've gone through a period in the last 20 years, largely uh, because of the jurisprudence of uh, Justice Scalia, where we pay huge attention to the text in organizing constitutional doctrine. But the reality is that most of our government functions in, the, in an interstitial way, in areas that are not governed by text. How much independence should agencies have? How much independence should the Justice Department have from the executive? Can the president weigh in on a criminal prosecution? Can the president direct an, an opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel? None of that is left to constitutional design. That's all something about how things work out. And it's depended a great deal on uh, both the integrity of the people who hold those positions and the restraint exercised by the executive in the use of the tremendous power the executive has. There's a quote from, uh, from Gladstone that uh, ultimately government depends on the good faith of those who exercise power. And that's more how we've gotten along than we like to admit. We have more of a Dicean type tradition than is often acknowledged in our jurisprudence. Um, the difficulty comes when you have an administration that rejects these boundaries that have grown up historically just as a matter of institutional accommodation. And then you don't have the check of an act of Congress because our Congress is disorganized at this point. You don't have restraint exercise, constraint exercise by political parties because our parties have largely become platforms for one or another candidate for president. And so what happens is that the only force that confronts growing executive power is the judiciary. And that's not just true in the United States, it's true increasingly in Britain, it's true in France, it's true uh, in Italy, it's true in South America, it's true in South Africa. You, you can go country after country where the crisis of our time in democracies is the weakness of the legislative branch. If you look at our constitutional structure, the framers of our constitution assumed congressional domination of our government. Mm. And in fact, they were worried about so much congressional power that they tried to specify exactly each area in which Congress would have delimited powers. When it comes to the executive branch, which is Article 2, not Article 1 of our Constitution, it's pretty vague and, and pretty open textured because they didn't think the president would be that significant. Now we have a Constitution that's sort of flipped on its yeah. head. And if Congress isn't going to play the checking function, things come to the, to the judiciary all the time. Can the president redirect funds to build the wall? Can the president re, uh, refashion immigration policy? Whether it's Obama or Trump, you have the same kinds of issues. And a judiciary that constantly has to bear the brunt of challenges to executive, increasing executive authority is in a very precarious situation. Now you have an executive which um, partly as a result of the influence of uh, Justice Scalia um, has moved to an originalist, um, a somewhat textualist approach to uh, the interpretation and application of the Constitution. Where is this judiciary going to find uh, the bounds of executive power because they're not there in the text of the Constitution? What you see in recent decisions, and it's a fascinating development, is that the judiciary is trying to figure out whether President Trump, who's the most transgressive, regardless of political affiliation, what's clear is that he's the most transgressive president in terms of claims of authority uh, that we've had since Andrew Jackson. 
Um, what they do is something that's very familiar across the pond, as we say, and actually we're starting to recognize it here. They say, has he acted in a way which is consistent with the way the office has been organized by other presidents? So you look at one of our most notorious recent cases, the travel ban case, in which the, uh, the Supreme Court upheld the revised uh, attempt to limit immigration into the United States from certain countries uh, by the Trump administration and said, look, a similar power was exercised by, Justi by President Kennedy under these provisions and by President Johnson and Nixon and so on. And they said he's acting within the bounds of what has been settled institutional practice. This sounds like English constitutionalism. It's not something that looks to within the text because the text can't answer that question. It sounds a lot like, uh, is it Justice Jackson's jurisprudence in this field? It's exactly like Justice Jackson, and, and Justice Jackson should be remembered for two things. He's very famous, I know, including in Australia, for the uh, typologies of presidential power, the steel from the steel seizure opinion. But he's also famous for his dissent in Korematsu, nice. where he said, there are some things that the judiciary just cannot handle because they're too uh, freighted politically, militarily, strategically, and we do a bad job when, when we handle, try to handle that. So he was inviting judicial intervention depending on the relationship between Congress and the executive and then trying to back off when both of them have acted in the name of emergency. The problem for the Jackson typology, which we confront today, is what happens when Congress is not there? Where does the judiciary go when, you know, the way I, I've written about this recently, Justice Jackson said that when Congress has not acted and the executive is claiming a power, that's the twilight area, that's the hardest. In some sense, as I wrote recently, we're living in perpetual twilight now because we don't have enough congressional input. And we've, we're only starting to appreciate how damaging that is to our entire firmament of constitutional law, including for the role that the judiciary has to play, necessarily has to play. You mentioned the travel ban case or series of cases uh, a moment ago. We might finish on that. Let's, let's just talk about the way in which that, that unfolded. In Australia, if there was a really serious challenge to national executive action, it would be brought in the original jurisdiction of the High Court and um, it would be dealt with by way of a special case uh, and it would be done and dusted within a few months. It would all be over. But that's not the way these issues play out within your system, is it? No, but you have to remember that our system has only recently come to this. If you look at, at the first almost 200 years of our constitutional history, how many times has the action of the, a, a congressional statute been struck down as unconstitutional? And the answer is a handful. Mm -hmm. And then starting in the 1980s, it starts to take off, and then we have many struck down by the Supreme Court. Then if I had asked you a question 15 years ago and I said, how many times has a federal district court, the lowest mm -hmm. instant court, seen it fit to strike down a congressional statute as unconstitutional, the answer would have been vanishingly small mm -hmm. because it wasn't seen as part of the judicial function. Now, everybody, you know, upon getting his or her commission thinks the first thing I got to do is strike something down as unconstitutional. What kind of judge would I be otherwise? And that has radically transformed um, the way these questions play out because what it does is before it would have been teed up by the lower courts, ultimately, that if it's a real constitutional issue, the Supreme Court would have to handle it. Now what happens is you're getting injunctions issued by one judge, and to be fair to the administration, the concern is that because the travel ban occurs everywhere, I can go to a judge anywhere in the country and I can figure out where I'm likely to get a more sympathetic judge. So I go to a judge, I get a nationwide injunction, now it comes up framed in a way that maybe the government doesn't want, maybe the court doesn't want, but it has to be taken. And it makes it all the more explosive because cases that 
in the wisdom of the judiciary would have been postponed or not confronted. At some point, you will have to deal with the migration mm -hmm. issues, as your court well, as you well know. But sometimes you let these things settle and mature, and that has been taken away from the courts right now. Well, it's been taken away by the courts themselves, by you're the, saying. <laughs> by the courts themselves, by the breakdown of a certain kind of restraint. And I think that one of the reasons for the breakdown is we don't have the same deferential view toward the integrity of political authority anymore. We don't believe that our political institutions are doing the kinds of important constitutional checking that the system really depended on. And just to bring it full circle, this fairly recent phenomenon of lower court judges seizing more power ups the stakes when it comes to the appointment of lower court judges, presumably. Absolutely, absolutely. The more that's at stake, if, if you tell them that they can only handle traffic tickets, not very many people are going to want the job and not very many people are going to get worked up about it. Well, on that note, we'll finish. Thanks, Thank Sam. You. It's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you very much.